everybody sitting here? to move forward. Okay, John, can you move forward a little bit just because so, you're in my shadow, yeah? Oh, you're in the dark. Well, <laughs> you're in the dark. say that my name is Stephen Litton. I'm originally from Litton, BC, part of the Interior Sailors Thompson First Nations. As uh, uh, out of respect for uh, the, the lands of which we participate in and um, work, eat, and play, I would like to acknowledge that we are on Squamish, Musqueam, and Broad First Nations territories. And uh, I would also like to thank them continuously um, from the bottom of our hearts that they've always been accommodating to our festival, for our festival, and other, any other initiatives. We have people from First Nations and people throughout the world that come and uh, participate here, so I would like to acknowledge them and thank the territories for allowing us to continuously 
allow us to do what we do, and that's to share the very beauty of who we are as people and sharing community, and that is the true heart, and that is the very reason we're here. It's, it's about the arts, but it's also about coming together, joining, weaving together our stories. Out of the ashes of the Phoenix, we've come here today to do that. I would also like to thank all the women for being here as well and acknowledge their work, their commitment to community, for you are the heartbeat of our nation. Without you, nothing else matters. Thank you. Enjoy the festival. music, uh, dance, and theater, we'd like to invite Renai Morisso to gather us together with a song. song from Ontario that was given to me by uh, dear friend Cheryl and uh, Sherry and uh, and the gathering song when this song was sung it was sung uh, for for people to come together to gather berries and to gather food when they were on the land but since we're here at the opening of this uh, book launch then uh, we were glad that you hear you little berries you know. <laughs> <laughs> Artist 
She works in music, uh, film and digital video, uh, theater. She's a, a singer and a musician, a writer, a director, an actress, and a producer. And she's been a big part of the heart of the city. Uh, next to her, we have James Fagan Tate, an award-winning director and playwright who's worked with most of the theaters in Vancouver and finds he keeps coming back <laughs> to the downtown east side. <laughs> Ethel Bibby, who's the uh, director of the Carnegie Community Center, she's celebrating her 10th year at the Carnegie this year. So congratulations, Ethel, and is also an artist in her own right. John Endo Greenaway beside me is the managing editor of the Bulletin. He's a founding member of Qatari Tyco and the designer uh, for the Heart of the City Festival and for the wonderful book that uh, we can all grab a copy of out in the lobby after the panel. <coughs> so um, I'd like to ask a question, uh, which is uh, how has your personal practice, the way that you make your art, been impacted by your work with the community? making community engaged theater. So theater where we don't necessarily make a show and take it out to people, but where we go out to the people and make something with them before we uh, share it again with the wider community. Can you, do you think you can start us off? Yes. Well, for, I just want to say it's such an honor and uh, a privilege to be a part of this event tonight and to be a part of all the, the, the events. Uh, with Terry and Savannah in the downtown east side and with all the makers and I'm especially, I, I have to acknowledge the amount of goodwill inside all of the events that I've been lucky enough to participate. The goodwill from the community is the, the driving force and the, the thrill behind doing uh, art in, in the communities, com community engaged art, however they call it nowadays in so many ways. And in terms of the question of how, how does it impact is the question, how does it impact on? On your work, on your practice particularly. I think you well, addressed this a little bit in the book, and so for, the, yeah. for those of us who haven't had a chance to read it yet, maybe you can dive in there. Well, uh, so I'm a director in the theater community, and I you know, have a, a, a background in being educated in, in, in a theater school, a traditional, uh, two th a traditional theater schools and a music school, um, and, and as a, an actor and a director, and, and the outcome of which was that I spent half of my life acting and half directing. And I think the thing about uh, the community plays, which uh, in, in the format that I've done them here in the downtown east side and with Kathy Stubbington and Enderby, um, we've used the model by Angelico. And Angelico was an English playwright who, who uh, started, uh, decided that she was fed up with doing the professional theater in London, England, and moved out to the, the Colway Trust in, in, in outside of London, and started working directly with community using her skills and, um, and so the, the one thing that you, you, you have to acknowledge when you come to the community, you're being hired to do this as a professional theater artist, and you have to make an exchange with them. You have to bring the community your greatest expertise. The best thing that you do, you have to bring to them in exchange for the goodwill. There's a, that's what the deal is, the, the bargain. And, and that's what I've always uh, remembered, is that you, you have to strive for the excellence that you know in your craft. And, um, and so you keep your standards uh, as professional standards and, and you are fluid with your expectations to, to make sure that you're able to draw the things that you know need to be uh, presented um, from the beautiful people who have so much to offer and who come, who come with a good will and that's what you're faced with which is very different than the professional theater. In the professional theater you can frequently encounter people that have done it all their lives and their goodwill has just run out. And that's all. <laughs> they're a little bit tired. It happens. It's fair enough. <laughs> but, but and so in the downtown east side, it was so delightful to come into an environment with so much dynamic and interest and thirst to channel everything that they, they wanted, the people wanted to say, many, all of you here, or many of you here, uh, wanted to say, wanted to express through theater, through music, through dance. And um, I think the thing I found out in Enderby where I did one of my first ones and here is that you have to, you have to become incredibly efficient in what you do. You cannot, you cannot waste time as a director. You cannot get, you have to be whimsical, but you cannot just let a rehearsal go into whimsy. You really have to be responsible for a large number of people's time 
and creativity and know how to channel it well. So I found that the predominant thing for me was learning very efficiently or found out what my efficiency was inside directing theater mm -hmm. and how to best uh, frame things. If I had a group of, it, it, the shows involve 150 people generally. And so if you have 40 children in the room and you're teaching them something and you have four days you have four rehearsals over a period of three months to teach them. You don't teach them something and then change it all the next time and then change it all. You have to know exactly how you're going to open the play before you get to the first day of rehearsal. And then you lay it out. You can change things along the way a little bit, but you don't want to be reblocking uh, young people uh, four times and have them so confused and, and uh, you know, uh, turning in circles for opening night. You want to give them a real clarity. And so, the community plays have always uh, honed all of my practices into efficiency and clarity, and also into a kind of um, economy, a language that's going to arrive at what I need, to what the play needs, and what the actors need in that moment without too much talk, without too much discussion. Um, I also found that, like I, had, I said in many places after I had uh, done the community play here and in Enderby that it was like doing a master's uh, when I went to do it because I had to use everything at my fingertips that I knew in the theater. I had to use it. I never knew when in the room I would happen to be called on to give that piece of information that might inspire that person from that experience back there. So it was one of those galvanizing experiences for, for me, always, where everything that I knew, the, the stakes were very high for what I knew in order to to maximize everybody's experience. Because this is about the community. It's not about me trying to get a, you know, a particular, uh, I don't know. It's not, it's, not about, it's not about my career. It's about making a community feel happy doing theater and introducing them to something that I have loved since I made plays in my backyard. You know, I've been doing community plays since I was six or seven in my backyard with all the neighborhood. And, and, uh, yeah. I wonder how many people started out that I, I stuffed animals for for the class. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's I think that um, looking at how we learn in our our community practice is a big part of the work and, and in the work that I've done in the community as well. It's made me a better professional artist. Um, and so Ethel, I wonder if we could turn it over to to you and your experiences in community art because you're coming from a different position working as a Carnegie and looking at the, the work and the commissioning from a different position but how, how has it impacted your, your ideas of yourself or your practice as a professional artist? Well I think um, ra rather than talking about myself as a professional artist mm -hmm. I think I, get, I might talk about how it's impacted my work as a <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, I was not coming from such uh, an organized context in terms of thinking about uh, community uh, theater, community engaged theater, as you referenced, because that, that, that's not what I do. Um, I arrived at the Carnegie Center when, you know, the um, I Love the Downtown East Side had already been done. Um, uh, uh, Terry and Savannah had already started the Heart of the City Festival. There was you know, there was already a groundswell there of community art. When I looked around the center, what I could see were all these people engaged in um, singing. There were lots of choirs with Pearl Peach and other people. And, and uh, had a regular writing group, um, of which we was So singers, writers, and and actors, they were all there. And there had already been some interest in opera. What we did at that time was at the community opera. And um, there was already an interest in opera in the community. And it made perfect sense to me because the issues in the community are really larger than life in ways. Um, so, you know, brought together uh, a, a small group of writers to um, to write together. Uh, unbeknownst to me, in some ways, that, that was the kind of thing to ask for me. And I should have been a writer. I am a writer. <laughs> 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 it, it, 
turned out amazingly, mm -hmm. um, and it was a lot of work for the writers to pull that off. Um, and and one of the things I was so amazed by uh, the product itself, which really was a product of those writers and singers um, and musicians. Yes, we had professionals, you know, so especially in the music section, mm -hmm. you know, sprinkled in to do the kind of backbone of some of some of that. But otherwise, it was very much a community project, and uh, the quality of what came out of that was was remarkable. And the the acting or singing against, you know, our expectations, for, you know, uh, what people brought to it. I think. Uh, just really deepened my understanding of that community and mm -hmm. what is possible there, what continues to be possible there, who people are. It was a, it was a really wonderful way for me to begin working in that community, engaged in that way. Mm -hmm. and, and I really came to understand that my job is really to, you know, to support those, those gifts that everyone is bringing um, in any way that and so do you feel like you still bring a, a bit of that I didn't know what I was asking into projects after having done them for, for 10 years? Does that still come up? Um, well, uh, well, first of all, we, we have tried very hard to create another opera mm -hmm. over the years and haven't been able to put it together. Mm -hmm. We got the writing done, mm -hmm. um, but haven't been able to pull it off in terms of financial. Um, it's not as if we turned around and every year did, did another one. There right. would have been a whole other learning uh, curve. Uh, but um, in terms of do I still um, do I still do I still feel like I I, I ask more than than people can or, or than fair to ask? Um, no, because what I learned was that it it uh, in the end people did. Right. You know, and it's not too much to ask, and uh, and instead um, have learned that there are ways to support people to do their work mm -hmm. that is not about us asking them to do it in any particular way. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. is, you know, like one of the things we do now is uh, small arts grants, so mm -hmm. people actually get individual grants to do this work, and that's that's that we're not defining that work in any way. There you find them making it work and making it work. Yeah. So, so, so it seems like there's been a bit of a, a transference of agency yeah. over over time. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Apple. Um, so, John, <laughs> you've been a part of the heart of the city. Uh, your your imagery is everywhere in it and on the the book. Um, how has working in community with Terry and Savannah impacted your practice, which of course extends in a different, in a different realm. You're working in graphic design as an editor, as a writer, as a musician. How has how has been uh, how has being in the heart of the city impacted you as an artist? It's hmm. a good question. I, I don't know. It's impacted me as an artist. It's impacted me as a human being for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of funny. Like my. My mother was Japanese Canadian from Moose Jaw. My father was um, English Irish descent from Manitoba. They ended up marrying against both their parents' wishes, moving to Europe, basically living a Bohemian lifestyle. Um, decided to move back to Canada, moved to Montreal, then Toronto, where we were living quite happily. And then my father got a phone call from Roy Kyoko, who was one of his uh, close friends, who said it was opening up the bank. Photographer, so we piled everything up in a U Haul, hauled ourselves across the country, and when I was 10, I ended up in, in Vancouver. And shortly after that, uh, my parents were involved in the uh, creation of Vancouver's, I think, either first or second housing co op um, on Union Street there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm still not sure if it's the first or second, I think it was the first. And it was there my mother reconnected with her uh, Japanese Canadian roots, mm -hmm. which she basically left by the wayside when, when she married my, my father. And it was here on Union Street that I discovered that I was in fact Japanese Canadian myself. Um, 
I mean, I sort of knew it abstractly. I thought it was different, but um, I started, you know, meeting other Japanese Canadians. Uh, I was in. Uh, I used to play guitar in their room, and uh, Takeo Yamashiro, who's a well-known Takashi player, lived in our in our complex in Kirby and Dane. Said, "Well, you should play at this coffee house at Dira on Koryo Street." And I did, and like that, I think it's unusual that you can you can. Um, identify a moment that changed your life, maybe, but that, that might change my life. And I met, you know, after the show, I, all these people come and say, well, we have a band, and it's called Hope for Rose, and it's an Asian Canadian band, you should join our band, and you should write songs, and, and that sort of, from there, it sort of changed my entire life trajectory, and, um, you know, it's gone here and there, here and there, and, you know, I live now in Port Moody with my family, but to be connected with this community through my work with Terry and Savannah, and the type of groups, um, and my work in the Japanese Canadian community, uh, is, is pretty profound. Um, and it all, the thing on that was planned, it was all mm -hmm. just sort of and haphazard. And I uh, met, well, Terry and I had different versions of how we met each other. <laughs> 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 well, we were practicing at the Strathcona Community Center, who for some reason let us practice there three times a week. You know, when we were practicing, nothing else could happen in the center. Right. You know, the drums are just mind-boggling mm -hmm. loud. And this fellow poked his head in the door, Terry, <laughs> and was quite inquisitive and wouldn't go away. Sound familiar? And that was the start of a beautiful relationship. <laughs> and a few years later when I Terry actually hired us for our first, our first gig on um, just a few blocks from here in Chinatown, mm -hmm. second floor there. And then years later, um, he was looking for a graphic designer, and I guess you'd see my work. And um, I was just starting on myself, and uh, that, that formed the basis of a, of a beautiful relationship. So in a way, you've grown up uh, with the festival as a, as a graphic designer, and you have obviously a much larger practice, but um, were there any things that, I mean, I think we, we see a real signature look to the programs so that you can identify, this is part of the city. And, mm -hmm. and every year, I, I'm always looking forward to who's going to be on the cover, right? <laughs> what's what's going to be the, that iconic <coughs> image that brings us into the unique theme for that year? Can you talk a little bit about how you um, how you find that image that, that leads us into the heart of the city? Well, one thing about the festival, I think Terry and Savannah really put a high priority on, on, on doing it right and on, on creating a, a powerful visual image for the festival. And to the point that every year they uh, book David Cooper, who's one of Vancouver's finest photographers, um, they book a, like a, almost a day long shoot with him, bring in things like hundreds <laughs> uh, for a day of shooting. Often we have a vague idea of what we're looking for, but you know, often we end up with a different image than what we started with mm -hmm. before. So David shoots, uh, Terry directs, sometimes I have some input, and at the end we look at all the pictures, and Terry basically goes through and says, well, that can work, that can work, that can work. Then I do a couple of mock-ups up, and mm -hmm. um, generally it, it's pretty obvious, I think, the yeah. image that, that really got, like this year was Stanley. When I first saw it, I thought, oh, that's, that's an okay image, but as we started working with it and mm -hmm. modifying it and refining it, it really came to life. It's actually one of my favorite mm -hmm. posters and covers. Yeah. So yeah. Thank so you. It's really a <coughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Which I think uh, speaks to the heart of how all of the work at the festival comes mm -hmm. to life, so it's very consistent in terms of the, the ethos of the heart. Yeah, it never feels like it's imposed. It feels like it, it comes very naturally out of the community and out of the faces and the energy that comes out of those flourishes. Mm -hmm. and it's, uh, I think that's the strength of it. Mm -hmm. Renai, you've been a part of some tremendous projects at the part of the City Festival and um, at the Moving Theatre. So I'm wondering, can you speak a little bit about how that's affected you as an artist? Because your practice is, of course, very wide and you have a lot of other work that you do. 
How has uh, working with the community here on the downtown east side impacted your practice? Well, I think it's made me a better person <laughs> in terms of uh, um, what do we mean when we talk about community engaged art practices. And I think that as um, I kind of go through the different um, processes in art and, and creating art and has always been about um, listening. Um, when uh, you were talking uh, about being a director, it's almost like there's times when uh, we're doing this work, and I think uh, with Savannah's help with story meeting, it was almost like there was um, being a director and also being a facilitator. Mm -hmm. That there was something about uh, engaging in the dialogue that needed to be said, that needed to be totally explored in terms of how this person or this particular scene and how those groups of people or that individual needed to find it within themselves, you know, mm -hmm. what, what I was requesting, what I was mm -hmm. wanting to, what I was seeing. And so the idea of, of, of um, deep listening and uh, um, making those actions uh, and those choices uh, as a director um, based on those things then it becomes more of, of the um, facilitating uh, ownership mm -hmm. of, of what it is that we're creating. And I think that, um, yeah, it made me a better listener. I, I, I just completed doing, and I've been doing this for the last four years, um, work in different First Nations communities uh, on reconciliation. And so I just finished uh, two days of intensive listening mm -hmm. to the Kwantlen First Nation mm -hmm. and what they experienced in terms of residential school. And I don't think that if I didn't have the experience with story weaving mm -hmm. of the deep listening and, and being able to, 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 to uh, give back what I'm hearing, mm -hmm. that the work that I'm doing today wouldn't be as, as deep as it is with, you know, with this, this uh, work with uh, mm -hmm. reconciliation circles in the British Columbia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I think that you did just a beautiful segue there. <laughs> because I think my next question for all four of you, and we can start in the same place, but if you want to leave in, feel free, um, is how you feel the work of the Heart of the City Festival has in turn impacted the community? Because I think we've, we've heard some really profound impacts that being an artist in that context has had. But I'm wondering, from, from your experience seeing the audiences at the Heart of the City Festival, uh, encountering the artists who have been making this work with you between festival times, how has that, how has this work uh, changed the neighborhood, or if not changed it um, in some way, uh, I don't know, it's like a, a chemical catalyst or something in the neighborhood. Jimmy, do you want to start off? Well, I, I think, and of course I've only been a part of maybe five or six projects, mm -hmm. but it feels to me that, that they, they each project uh, just creates uh, uh, a need for more. Mm -hmm. You know, like it, it, it creates a desire to, or it's, you know, people start uh, practicing the, the art in, in different ways, and they want to keep practicing, and so it fosters a desire to, to do more. And as soon as that happens, a, a community comes, the, the artists in the community become alive, mm -hmm. and and um, and so it, it and then and then uh, Terry and Savannah and other groups uh, start providing uh, opportunities where more can happen. And then Terry and Savannah also galvanize the people who are doing different things across the country. Of and course. brings them into the community to also share practices from other places, and and the community then becomes quite uh, and like quite alive in its in its art practice. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's one one way that I think the the uh, I mean I saw it happen from in the, the the play in the heart of the city to the next year in the festival, and I'm sure Ethel you saw it with I love the downtown east side like. 
how it, it, it like it just kept fostering new interest and a, a greater desire and, and it was almost like the community was leading it mm -hmm. and not the facilitators who were who were brought in to to be a part of it but I, I saw that the, the difference between um, in the heart of a city the play and then in the heart of a, the, in the heart of the city the festival mm -hmm. uh, within a year like how it was le le legions of interest not just the people who were on stage the first year but right. The people who wanted to be a part, who had mm -hmm. seen the first year and then became interested, and then there were there were more projects, and then those projects would just attract more people who wanted to be a part of a community event that was art, which is which is here today and gone tomorrow. To be just to be around each other, making something imaginary together. You know. So I wonder, maybe we can bring it to Ethel. Ethel, do you think part of that has to do with? Um, uh, in the community being able to see themselves reflected on stage? Is that part of what drives people once they've seen a show to go, that's what I want to do? Is that, what's your experience? Well, there's probably some of that, but I, I, I think it's also about possibility and, and opportunity. You know, people have uh, talent and skill and, you know, just sometimes don't have any place to put that. Mm -hmm. And you all have a place to put that. And uh, it was interesting, last night actually, at the event last night in the theater, I was, it occurred to me that we, the festival particularly, had kind of created a company. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it, it's not, it doesn't call itself a company, but that there's, a, a, and it's large, but there is a, this group of people who, who comes back and interacts in different ways and takes different roles and, and that if you sat back here and look at look at them, you think that's actually what has been created. And, you know, there have <coughs> been times when I felt frustrated there wasn't that there wasn't more resources and funding to do more uh, for, you know, that, that those people would then get a chance to do more. But maybe that was not last night I thought maybe that was faulty thinking anyway. That, that, so organic. I mean, there has been, you know, um, the festival has brought lots of resources to the community. Mm -hmm. and for everyone. Um, but it's at Carnegie, for instance, we've been able to do more. Maybe, maybe it wouldn't have been as organic or as as community driven in <laughs> some right. any way as yeah. it has been. So, yeah. And and <coughs> would you? Is there anything that you would identify that shifted at the Carnegie? over your 10 years as the festival has changed and grown as well? There's a lot of confident people there now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, who can show it, feel good about it, and know what they have to offer in the way it has. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So John, you're a part of a lot of uh, intersecting communities in the downtown east side, and of course with the uh, the history of Japanese Canadian immigration into this community, your own home being on the street out here. I live on Union Street too. Um, so, um, what, have, what have you seen change in the audiences in the neighborhood since the festival was born? I'm hard to answer that because I do live in the suburbs. Sure. And uh, but it, actually, it gives me a different perspective. I think um, I don't. I don't.
see that from the outside, and it's really impressed me that this, this approach that they've taken. And, um, and I've interviewed Terry about the time of propulsion over the years, and what he's always said is that he, you know, he wants to show the other side of the community, because most of the guys have the you know, safe injection sites and the, uh, the problems and the issues and the gentrification and the issues. And, you know, that, that, that's part of the reality down here. But I think they really try to to show a different side of the community yeah. to the outside world. And you know, when we advertise, we don't just advertise on a on a flat post outside of Carnegie. We, we publish um, ads in the Georgia Strait, mm -hmm. and we um, go to the mainstream media. But you know, over the years, have slowly picked up on that this is a really happening festival. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just a little.
talking about missing and murdered Aboriginal women. I don't know if I want to talk to the families it's, it's over there. But with the fact that she created this event, um, it's called Butterflies and Spirit. Mm -hmm. They have a Facebook page. And, um, and so what's really beautiful about when they did the, the dance at, on Georgia and, um, in April of this year, it was Native and non-Native people that were dancing. Mm -hmm. And it was something that, that, that naturally this issue is not just an Aboriginal issue. It's something uh, within our Canadian fabric, you know. Um, burying the sins of Canada is one thing to say. But it's also, it's also the fact that in, in our practices, we are able to, to glean a sense of healing and a sense of voice in, in uh, what we're doing with what we, what we need to say. And have you seen that a real shift then over the life of the festival in terms of the, uh, the voice for Indigenous uh, artists? Oh, of course. I think part, part of what I think the Vancouver Movie Theatre um, and uh, it is about is, is being able to, to, to listen in and, and, and hone in on what is this community. And in any, in any human um, development and human, our own human condition of, of dealing with social, educational, political, whatever that is, is out there. And, and there's also stories about that, whether that's in the history of it or what's happening today. And I think that um, Vancouver Movie Theater, Terry and Savannah, have been able to articulate that uh, visually, musically, uh, with, with movement, and uh, within the theater of the theater. Mm -hmm. I wonder, um, I'd just like to open it up to uh, our panelists if you have any uh, questions for each other, for the audience. Any last thoughts to uh, offer about your experiences with the Heart of the City? Uh, one of the things uh, uh, that I didn't mention before is that uh, the way it impacted on my own process is that leaving the, the downtown east side and then going back into the professional world and doing a show, it was very dry. It was a very, the, the palette was very colorless. Mm -hmm. And it was a series of professional people who had been trained in the theater specifically to do specific things. And that's a one, that can be a wonderful thing. But it, it, it was then that it occurred to me that I couldn't, I couldn't work in, in a narrow structure anymore. And, and, I, and I personally, and with other people, started the practice of integrating professionals, students, and community artists like Stephen and Kwe Ming and, and uh, Helen, and the people, people from the community into professional. Helen's a professional, of course. But, but how to, 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 to integrate people all together so that the culture of the place was no longer the culture of what was called the, the, the trained professional actor, but was the, the culture of a community. Mm -hmm. and to watch how young people, how community artists, how professional artists would, would all work together in contexts like crime and punishment or the idiot which we did in, in, uh, connect, in, in, in uh, cooperation with Vancouver Moving Theatre and New World Theatre. And, and, and those practices started changing my ideas about around all sorts of things, including diversity in the theatre, that being a, a really important mandated thing that needed to, to occur everywhere. At Barton Beach, when I directed, I was able to to start like demanding uh, certain certain communities of people existing at, in in the people that I was directed by, Beach. and so it, it you know that kind of thing like it keeps on impacting uh, throughout you know and then and then Stephen starts working with uh, Patty Allen and Patty Allen starts changing the way she acts or Patty Allen who's a great actor in the traditional professional community looks at Kwe Ming Ling and phones me at night and says what's she doing in rehearsal. And I said, well, she's, she's doing her thing. And she said, yeah, but what is it? Articulate it so I can do it. <laughs> just, just, just watching Kwe Ming. And Kwe Ming came up to Patty the next day and said, oh, Patty, you're so amazing. You just put layer upon layer upon layer. And Patty said, yeah, but what do you do? <laughs> and he said, I don't do anything. In fact, I got it. <laughs> Sure.
circulation of ideas of experiences that are coming back and forth between the professional theater community, the huge artist community here in that kind of side, and that that porousness really just brings a richness uh, yeah. to both kinds of experiences. And possibilities, as Ethel was saying, though, it's, it's the, the thing about possibilities, it's, I mean, that was just one model that, you know, you keep tinkering, but you can figure a million ways to come at it. Uh, once you, you enter it into a zone that has uh, so much goodwill and energy and, 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 and cultural history, you know. But then you, you, you start flying as, as an artist yourself and, and, and can do so with other people. I think there's, a, there's an openness in the, in the festival openness to basically anything, to ideas. <laughs> but to me, the mandate is, is to be open and to celebrate uh, the people who live and work here. And it's, um, I think it could be a model for a lot of other communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that certainly um, was a, a big part of the, uh, the track symposium and the train of thought project that, uh, for those of you in uh, HowlRound Lab aren't familiar with them, please do check out uh, Vancouver Living Theatre's website. Um, there's some tremendous research and uh, gathering of information around how community work is made across uh, the country, and it's a tremendous project you should check out. Any other last thoughts? Okay. Um, we do have a couple of other things on our uh, docket before we retire to the common area and leave our HowlRound fans uh, to their own devices. Um, I'd like to uh, to do a little bit of rearranging. I'll, I'll ask them to uh, say a thank you to Jimmy and Ethel. And John, I'm going to get you to stay here. We're going to get Terry and Savannah to come up and, um, and join us for the actual official launching of the book. Uh -oh. And then um, after we do that, Renai is going to sing us out. Um, okay. 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 Center, 
uh, Seeger and the Raw, um, Delana Gail Bowen Productions, and Savage God are five of the companies that are featured in the book. I think it's 12, 12 different productions. And um, so um, we really wanted the book to, to really speak and reflect to and honor and pay tribute to the work that's come out of this community. And, um, and I hope that, that people really look at it from that perspective. Savannah and John and I have the, the pleasure and the honor to be able to facilitate that process to bring um, the book into reality, but it, it really is, has been made possible because of, of the people in this community that have made these productions and, and helped us put together this book. Um, I really want to acknowledge um, some, particular, some people in particular. Um, uh, Barbara Pooling um, came to us um, probably a couple of years ago. We had, we had produced an original uh, a, a preview copy of the book and um, uh, we shared it with our community and we started getting feedback on it. And we really saw that there was a whole other way that we needed to um, move forward on the book. And working with Barbara, who's here in the house with us, um, who's a professional um, editor, <coughs> um, she, she gave us tremendous insight and support into how we could, how we could um, reframe the book so it had a better structure. Um, um, redo the design so that it was better um, understood from a, from a reader's point of view of where you are in the book and, um, and um, really helped us define um, the shape of the book and what, it, what would be a better way for the book to, to live. So thank you, Barbara, for that tremendous work and that support. It was really vital for us um, in helping us move to the next stage of the book and we really appreciate mm -hmm. the help that you gave, which was completely a volunteer, I must say. So mm -hmm. thank you about that. Um, also really want to thank um, Richard Marcuse, um, who um, became um, an editor within the book too, in the sense of reading every line within the book and finding hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of <laughs> <laughs> thousands of typos and ways that dashes should be used that we had no idea <laughs> that dashes had such a importance <laughs> <laughs> within books. Yeah. I think John was beside himself by the, by the number of words that we, or phrases that required dashes. And, um, and, and really, Rick really helped us to move the book to another um, to another level um, in terms of its, um, its its reading ability, and um, so we're really grateful for for the work that Rick did and the, and the, and the hours and hours and hours and hours that he put into the book. Um, and uh, Rick, unfortunately, can't be with us here tonight. Um, some other really key people or organizations I really want to thank. Um, well, I guess I should thank Simon Fraser University um, in a very roundabout way. Um, when Simon Fraser University moved into Vancouver, um, we were invited in, into uh, the downtown east side. Savannah and I were invited to um, a big event. And there was hundreds of people there. And the president came up and he stood on the stage. And Wasn't the president? Somebody very high placed yes. <laughs> in the organization. And he stood on stage and said, and I quote, we are, we are going to bring culture to the downtown. <laughs> <laughs> and Savannah and I looked at each other and we said, we have to do something about this. <laughs> and that's when the book idea for the, the book was born at that moment because we realized that there's such an ignorance and lack of understanding about what's going on here in this community that we really needed to create something that would have a, you know, um, to be used to educate people um, and to celebrate what it is, you know, here in the community for the people that participate in the books, but also educate the newcomers to the community about the incredible culture and the work that's going on there in the downtown East Side. And so further to that, um, um, the Vancouver Foundation um, came on board and um, um, uh, uh, one of the program officers there, I can't remember her last name, but her first name is Mariko, 
Um, she personally um, made sure that we got funding for this project, and the BC Arts Council came on board um, supporting the project, and the uh, City of Vancouver also put up money towards the project, too. So I, I want to acknowledge and thank our funding partners for making this happen. Um, but to pull it back and gain, it's really been a very um, community initiative, and um, we've all done this together, and my deep appreciation goes out to all the writers and all the contributors from all the projects that, that ha have made this book possible, and it's been an honor and a, and a privilege for me to be able to work with, with them, with the community to make the book happen, but also with Savannah and John, um, pull off the book. Um, it's, as John has mentioned earlier, it's been a very collaborative process, and um, I, I personally really, really enjoy working with John. Um, he does approach his work as an, from an artistic perspective and um, accepts and listens to all my, well, I shouldn't say accepts, but <laughs> so, uh, listens to all my crazy ideas. <laughs> <laughs>
Ruth Howard from uh, Toronto, who is one of the contributing writers of the book, is the artistic director of Jumbo's Theatre that is doing tremendously exciting work in Ontario and in collaborations with people across the country. Anyway, and as one of the writers of the book, she has also created a, um, uh, a, a silk screen fabric map that's inspired by the design of the book. And so I encourage you after we leave this room to go and to share any of the words that come to you from the book or any kinds of reflections that you may have had as a, being part of the productions, <coughs> hearing about productions, witnessing them, uh, and uh, <coughs> wishing you'd seen them. Yeah. But anything that you might like to share from them. But yeah, basically, come and write something on a leaf for Terry and Savannah, because we're trying to make a beautiful thing to leave with them. And the more people that do it, it's really simple. The more beautiful a piece we're going to have to leave. I need people to do it in order to complete that little art piece there. So Thank come you. and join us at the table and, and, and indulge us. Thank you. And it's fun. Oh, and I'm sorry, just before I pass on to John, <laughs> it has been a huge honor and a pleasure to collaborate with him over these two years and uh, with the kind of artistry, efficiency, generosity that you bring to the collaborative process and your capacity to listen and to really grasp an understanding of the festival or the production or whatever it is that we're working with and to really look into the heart of it and to bring that forth in visual form. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I, I generally feel that most of the heavy, heavy lifting is done by other people and I'm just basically just sort of putting a, a beautiful video over top of it. Um, it has really been an honor that you probably got it from what I said earlier these people over the years. Um, and to, to bring it all together, because many of those productions we worked on together, not all of them, but the majority of them we, we worked on together over the years, and to bring it all together into a compact book like this was, was, was pretty amazing. Um, you know, often as a designer you are basically manifesting other people's visions. And I was really uh, moved and honored when the uh, Shortly before the book was published, that uh, Terry Savannah tried to give me writing credits for the book and put me as a co-writer for the book, and that really meant a lot to me. Um, I'm also grateful that I got the book out before the end of the production. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 